our Father, we just thank you for this moment of being able to praise you, the triune God who has brought us life, who has saved us from our sin, and who we live for for the rest of eternity. Father, humble us, allow our hearts to hear and our minds to hear as well, that we may be transformed <clears throat> with knowledge, but also with our hearts. Uh, give Dr. Rabin the words to speak, that she may speak your words, not hers, and that it will just be a blessing for us, and that we would be able to praise you all the more. Praise you and love you, in Jesus' name. Jess, introducing Dr. Rabin, or am I introducing Dr. Rabin? Uh, we have Dr. Rabin this week, um, really amazing professor and amazing teacher. Uh, I'm very excited to hear what she has to say. So everyone, welcome Dr. Raven. Good morning. That was beautiful singing. I just closed my eyes there at the end and listened to you guys. So thank you for that. Well, this morning, I want to share with you my spiritual journey that I've been on for the last four weeks. I'm a different person today than I was four weeks ago. And the journey began when Lakeisha emailed me and said, would you speak in chapel? Well, I had turned them down in the fall, so I thought, okay, I need to, to do this. So I prayed and I asked the Lord, what would you have me to say to this group this morning in chapel? And I thought about it. I thought about it for about a week. And then one night I was laying in bed, and the idiom, it's too good to be true, popped into my head. And I thought, wow, as you know, if you've taken transformational Bible teaching from me, I like to have a big idea that's short and memorable. And I thought, yes, everybody can remember that. It's too good to be true. I can talk about God's love and his forgiveness and how really, as a sinner, that's too good to be true that a God who is loving and forgiving would do that for me. I thought, it's perfect. Everybody's going to remember that. But guess what? God had another plan. <laughs> I looked up the definition of it's too good to be true, and it has both a positive and a negative connotation. For example, the positive would be, Wow, this ice cream is so delicious. I have never tasted anything like it before. It's really too good to be true. Or we have a negative connotation that can imply that this person or this situation or whatever it is seems very good, but it's not real. For example, she was so kind to me. Mm, she's usually not like that. What's up? That was really too good to be true. That's not going to happen again. And while I was in chapel one day, this still small voice said to me, I heard you are not living as if I'm too good to be true in the positive, but you're living as if I'm too good to be true in the negative. And I thought, what? Yes, you're complaining about life, and you are work, not working, and it, that life's not working out the way that you planned. You are living as if you're in control. And I thought, mm, I can't argue with that. He's right. I am complaining about the situation that I'm faced with right now. So I headed to the library, and I thought, I'm going to talk this morning about contentment. Yeah, I've got my title. It's too good to be true. Didn't happen. I went to the library. I found some books. And one of the books that I picked up was this book by Paul Tripp, who is actually one of our alumni. It's called All. And I looked on the back, and I looked in the preference. I looked in the table of contents. There's nothing on contentment in this book. Why did it pop up? So I was curious, and I read it. And I cried while I was reading it. Because all has everything to do with being contented. And so 
my topic this morning changed to beware of all amnesia. Now, you may not be struggling with discontentment, but I'm guessing you may be struggling with something else, with a negative feeling or negative people or a negative situation that's replaced pop your proper all for God. I needed a reminder that God hasn't promised me the good life. He hasn't promised you the good life. He hasn't promised you good grades. He hasn't promised you a job after you graduate. But what he has promised is that he is going to change us, he is going to grow us, and he is going to satisfy us. But we can't do this if we have all amnesia. So I want to give you the answers that I discovered to three questions this morning. One, what is all amnesia? In other words, what am I forgetting? What are you forgetting that gets in the way of the life that God wants for you? Two, how do you know that you have it or don't have it? And three, what can you do about it? So what is all amnesia? Does God say anything about it in Scripture? Yes, he does, and we're going to look at that today. But first, we need to talk about what is all, A-W-E. So what I want you to do is I want you to turn to the person beside you, and I want you just to give them a brief definition of what you think all is. I'm going to give you about 30 seconds, and then I'm going to call you back. Do you understand? Okay, so go ahead and give your definition. Okay, hope everybody had a chance to do that. Now, did you have a ta hard time coming up with a definition? Maybe you did, maybe you didn't, kind of. Somebody shout out one, their definition, just two people. Somebody. Pure bafflement of something or someone. Okay, bafflement, okay. Anybody else? What? To be, in of, like, to be in amazement of something, yeah. Well, I Googled all, and I found a website called The Science of All. There's actually scientists out there who are studying all. And they define all as a complex emotion that can be difficult to precisely define. <laughs> so that wasn't very helpful. But usually when we're in awe of something, it captures your attention. It captures my attention. And there's an emotional response to it. We have probably felt inspired, joyful, happy, all of those emotions. Or you know, something spectacular happens or out of the ordinary and it gets our attention and we're in awe of it. For example, when you go to a wedding, you see newlyweds and they're kind of in awe of each other. Or maybe you see a beautiful sunset and it inspires you. Or you go to a magical place and it makes you happy. Or you eat an awesome dessert, especially if it's chocolate and those endorphins come in there and you have that feel-good chemical in your brain. You can probably think of other people and places and situations or even the beauty of nature that causes you to be in awe. I don't know about you, but life is not always awesome. And I was in a situation that wasn't very awesome for me. And I suffer at times from all amnesia. And it has a tremendous negative effect on my spiritual life. And it can have a negative effect on yours. You may not even realize it. So how do I know if I have all amnesia? Well, Paul gives us a clue in the passage what we're going to read this morning. So if you could turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to look at verses 14 and 15. It's also up in the, on the screen if you don't have your Bibles. While you're turning there, I'm going to give you a little bit of background on this chapter. 
It is the theme of reconciliation. In the beginning of the chapter, Paul compares our earthly body to our heavenly one. Because while we're here on earth, we're weak and we need transformation. It needs to take place in our life. We need to learn how to please the Lord. And Paul stresses here in this chapter that how we live and the things we do matter because we will appear before God in the final judgment. And then in verse 11, Paul reminds the Corinthians that everything he does is because of his fear of the Lord. And when you look at that fear of the Lord, that's a reverent fear. It's when he's in awe of God that he can fear him. He knows who he serves. And then he speaks about Christ's death and resurrection, that it's for all of us. And Paul reminds the Corinthians of these truths in hopes that they will return to a right relationship with him. It's a message of reconciliation. So let's read verses 14 and 15. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. And we see that, ver that word all. That means you and that means me. It's all of us. And once we accept his death and resurrection, who do we live for? Paul says we don't live for ourselves, but we live for him who died and was raised for us. You see, that verse 15 is all about bewaring of all amnesia. Sin redirects our all for God and it puts all on self. I want the good life. I want health. I want AIDS, A's on my grades. I want the accolades, the success. Whatever it is, I know best instead of relying on God who gives us what we need. And in chapter 3, we see that Paul states he is not sufficient, but his sufficiency comes from God. Therefore, when he faces difficulties, and we know Paul did face many difficulties, even more than we have, in chapter 4, in verse 8 and 9, he says, We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. Why could Paul say that? Because he was in awe of God. And I want this same all that he had. Paul is warning, beware of all amnesia. When we put ourselves in the center of the story, we become a danger to ourselves and to other people. Because, as Paul Tripp said in his book, only when God is in his rightful place will we set ourselves and others in the appropriate place in our hearts. So think about that. We have to be in all of God in order for there to be a balanced, satisfying life. And we can't be in all of self instead of God. I was in all of self, and I was saying, I need something in addition to Christ in order to make me happy. I need something else to give me life. This situation needs to work out like I planned it. What are you saying that you need in addition to Christ? If I could just graduate, things would be so much better. If I could just get married if I could have a child, if I could have more money, if I could have a job after I graduate. Sometimes those things are what we look at to satisfy our life. We've heard in Scripture today that God doesn't want us to live for ourselves. He can satisfy and renew our life, but we don't always live as, as if we believe that that's true. Again, it's going back to that it's too good to be true. Why is it difficult? Well, because all of God is quickly replaced with all of self. We see this in the beginning of Genesis with Adam and Eve. They believe the lie of Satan. If you'll just eat of this tree, you'll be like God. You won't need him. You won't need to depend on him. It's all of yourself. 
the Israelites in the wilderness. Moses is up on the mountain communing with God. And they're down at the bottom of the mountain building an idol to replace him. An all of God and an all of self. So what can we substitute for all of God? If you'll look up on your screen, you'll see some things that we can substitute for all of God. Now, none of these things are bad within themselves. I mean, we need to eat. We need to have money so we can pay our bills. But when we substitute them for all of God, that's when it becomes an issue. So we need to beware of all amnesia. So how do I know if I have all amnesia? All amnesia? Because maybe you're looking up at the screen and you're thinking, oh, I don't have a problem with any of that. I would have said that too. But here up on the screen are some indicators that we are in all of ourself. One is complaining. When it's all about you and your desires, you will have much to complain about. We fall into the trap of talking more about what we want or do not have than what God has given us. Self-centeredness. We want to be comfortable. We want to be predictable. We want life to be predictable, pleasurable, easy. Entitlement. I deserve this. I have a right to this. I think Tripp explained it well in his book when he said, you live in pursuit of what you think you need, deserve, or have a right to, and you start to judge the love of God and the people in your life by their willingness to deliver it. Discontentment. That was my problem. I have a personal plan for my life, and God and other people need to get on board with it. And when they're not, discontentment settles in. What about relational dysfunction? You look to others for meaning, for joy, for identity and satisfaction. But people are flawed and don't have the ability to maintain this level of satisfaction, and they're going to disappoint you. But God will never disappoint us. Control. We lose patience or we become frustrated because we're not in charge. Fear and anxiety can rob our joy. Anger. People are mad with God because he's not answering their prayers. Why has he not answered me? Why is God not making sure that all my days are good ones? Give us what we expect, God, not what you promised. Envy is a lack of contentment. Drivenness, exhaustion, we're tired because we're trying to do it ourselves. Doubt, when God does not give us what we want, we will begin to doubt his goodness and his love. And then spiritual coldness ends up happening because our, our perspective of life shrinks to our personal hopes and dreams. All of God calls us back to abandon our plan for the greater and more glorious plan that he has established for us. So, what can we do about it? What is the solution? The solution is simple but difficult at the same time. First, we need to grieve the fact that we've lost perspective, that we've not acknowledged that God is in control, that God is our Father and our Lord, and that we've had all of self. Two, we need to go before God with humility of spirit and confess that we've lost proper perspective. Confess your all amnesia, your all of self. And then we need to submit to his ownership and depend on the Holy Spirit to break the bondage to self. That word submit means to send under. And we get above God when we do not confess and yield to his lordship. We need to be brought under God's authority, his sovereignty and his power over our life. We need to start each day focusing on the awesomeness of God. I have a book called Face to Face by Kenneth Boa, and at the beginning of this book, the first thing that he has you focus on 
is the attributes of God. And that helps you to kind of replace that all of self and realize who God is. To be blown away by His holiness and His goodness and His love and His mercy for us. And then respond to that awareness with the willingness to do whatever He asks you to do. It's a, a proper all of God. Now, I work through these steps of confession, of submitting, surrender, of focusing on God and responding. I still have the same situation that I was faced with when I talked to you at the beginning of this message, but there's a difference. I am not discontented anymore because I have a renewed sense of who God is. Will I struggle again? Probably. But I hope that when I struggle again that I am going to recognize it quicker and beware of all amnesia. There is much to be in all besides yourself. The physical world around us is what God created to remind us that we're not alone, that He is there for us, and we're not the center of the world. As Sandra McCracken stated in an article in Christianity Today, as we gaze upon our Creator and our Lord, our lives are illuminated by the shimmer of His glory. It's like glitter in a preschool classroom. His glory goes everywhere. If you've ever done a project with glitter, and Dr. Clawsley was talking about that at the beginning of this morning, that it goes everywhere. It goes all over the table, not just a project. But it stays, it sticks, and it shines. If you've ever got it on your face, it's just shining there, right? And the same thing happens when we spend time with God. He sticks, he stays, and he shines. The glitter that you were handed today is a reminder to be in awe of God and beware of all amnesia. But before we leave today, I want us to practice focusing on all of God. So Drew is going to come up, and he's going to read Psalm 145. You can either follow along in your Bibles, or you can close your eyes and listen to Drew as he reads. But I just want you to really focus, as Drew reads, on the awesomeness of God. Psalm 145. I will extol you, my God, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you, and I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and highly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wonderful works i will meditate men shall speak of the power of your awesome acts and i will tell of your greatness they shall eagerly utter the memory of your abundant goodness and will shout joyfully to your righteousness the lord is gracious and merciful slow to anger, and great in loving kindness. The Lord is good to all, and his mercies are over all his works. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord. And your godly ones shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and talk of your power, to make known to the sons of men your mighty acts and the glory of the majesty of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord sustains all who fall, and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due time. You open your hand, 
and satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his deeds. The Lord is near to all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He will also hear their cry and will save them. The Lord keeps all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. Thank you, Church. So if, we, if you can stand, I want to send you out with a blessing. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called to one body, and be thankful. God is awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raven. That was phenomenal and very well needed. Thank you.